Welcome to the Calder Farmstead. Now the ice hawks back out to center in transition. Carlson with Quinville two on one. Right wing Carlson comes with Quinville scores. Here's a chance for Barrett. Fight for the On the face off. Up it's Eminger. Go back to Wierenski. Has it. Shoots one. Bounces off a man. Five seconds left. Wierenski. Another jam on the shot. Turning it. Firing. Now, with nine minutes gone in overtime, the Bears breaking out. Right side with Bear. Looks like cutting for the net. Bear will go. And here are your hosts, CeCe and Sean. Hello and greetings from the Mile High City of Denver, Colorado. And Olensalo, Finland. Welcome to the Calder Farmstead podcast, episode number 99 for Friday, May 6th. 2022. If you were hoping for a podcast featuring an outline of easy crops to grow in early springtime markets, we are not going to be much help. This is an American Hockey League podcast, and my name is CeCe Hockley, the AHL editor of Full Press Hockey. And I'm Sean O'Brien from Stats Track and the AHL's only league-wide analytics guy. And as always, we thank you for tuning in with us. And if you're new to hearing Cece and I talk about hockey, we're going to both recap and preview some of the 21-22 Calder Cup playoffs first round matchups for you. Both watch a lot of AHL a lot of AHL games, and we're going to talk about what we see when we watch the film, as well as use some advanced stats to help us break it down. If that's new to you, you may want to head over to our podcast feed or YouTube channel, wherever you're listening to us from, and check out episode zero. It's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about, as well as how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're new to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms like PDO or the point shares model or newer hockey terms like controlled zone entries, go check that out. So you better be able to pick up what I'm putting down. I promise it's not that nerdy or technical. It's only 20 minutes. And let's be honest, you waste 20 minutes studying for the LSATs. You probably spent more than 20 minutes in actuality, but you'll never get that time back. So next time, why not spend a little more time with us talking hockey? Yeah, not not going into the uh, the legal realm um, by any means. So I definitely haven't been spending spending time studying for the LSAT. All right, we have two second round series to preview here for the Calder Cup playoffs, the 2022 Calder Cup playoffs. But before we do that, we've had two of the best of three series in the first round wrap up. And so we have two recaps to cover as well. And the first one is in the Atlantic Division, and we figured we'd br bring a friend back, bring a friend on, and he's no stranger to the Bridgeport AHL team who uh, who took care of a little bit of business. Eyes on aisles, deck hands, Mitch Anderson. Mr. Anderson. We miss you. <laughs> <laughs> brings me back to high school when everyone yeah. was like, oh, Mr. Anderson in like yes. a heavy French accent. Uh, it was yeah. excellent. I, I loved the, the, that time in high school. It made me feel like I could just dodge bullets, uh, which I couldn't. <laughs> Because I, was I not would not recommend athletic. seeing. I wouldn't recommend seeing the latest movie though, because that will probably ruin that time for you. Oh, oh no! I no. was hoping it would be all right. I was too. I haven't Damn seen it yet. And Sean gives his sneer and very bad. Of very very bad. Uh, uh, I am yeah. sorry, but Mitch, thanks for coming back on the program. Um, number three, Providence against number six, Bridgeport. Game one was on Monday night. Bridgeport was at Providence. Bridgeport in controversial fashion. Winning that game two to one in overtime. Uh, we'll get to that here in a second. Game two, Providence at Bridgeport, Wednesday, May 4th. May the 4th be with you. May the 4th be with Bridgeport because it was winning again in OT, two to one, back to back overtime, two to one victories for the Bridgeport Islanders. And they're on to the second round to face Charlotte. Tall task, but uh, Viacon Dios to Bridgeport. But Let's uh let's not get ahead of ourselves. Sean, let's talk picks. And um, yeah, you can you can <laughs> we we were all on Providence here, but like tepidly so. No, I, I I even said in my pick, I'm like, I can see an upset happening here, but I went Providence because I thought Mujanel would be the better coach than Brent Thompson. Uh the model had Providence as a 51.6% favorite in the series. I will say, in my defense of both of those. Uh, the model and I both thought Cameron Hughes was going to play in this series. Uh, that's Providence's leading scorer. He was sir not appearing in this film. And 
had I known that going into our preview, um, Bridgeport would have been the favorite by the model, and I would have taken Bridgeport um, in this series. I would have taken them in three games, but Providence missing, you know, their number one score is a, a huge factor in that. It, it was the factor, I, I I would say, really, because when you look specifically that first game, right before Providence scores that first goal, or or when they score that first goal, they had thirty two shots on net through thirty three, almost thirty four minutes in the game. 33 shots on Corey Schneider, who, who has played well down the stretch, but he shouldn't be playing this well. Uh, and he was absolutely dynamic, uh, making, we said May the 4th, absolute Jedi mind tricks all over the place, willing pucks into gloves that shouldn't be there, specifically in game two. But had they had that finisher with him, and I, I forget who was, uh, who tweeted it out, I think it was Inside AHL Hockey, um, tweeted out, like, they, they being the Providence Bruins, didn't have... Uh, players who accounted for 30 percent of their goals over the regular season and so if yeah, you don't mark, have that kind of finishing and you've getting the, you're getting the shots right yeah you don't that have was that, mark, good luck i think i think his name is mark diver or there's two v's in there I, i'm assuming diver? it's diver it could be diver i i don't know they don't have pronunciations on twitter but uh yeah <laughs> uh not no cameron hughes no jesper frodian no edwards traumax no chris wagner uh, 30% of their regular season goals were not in the line, uh, were guys not appearing in this movie. Um, that's, wow. that is always going to tie your hands behind your back. And I mean, it definitely gave, uh, it definitely made Bridgeport the better team in the series on paper. And they executed their game plan, which was to muck it up, make it an ugly physical grind and to break pucks out well. And they by and large did that. And I'd at least like to say, even though we both picked Providence in our preview, uh, we called Corey Schneider as the X factor. Like that was our, if, if one person is going to put their thumb on the scale of this series positively or negatively, it's going to be Corey Schneider. And <laughs> it very much was Corey Schneider. Um, the Providence police department is still looking for him after stealing game one. <laughs> yeah, no, he absolutely stole that. And, and he was obviously the, the difference in the series. It really wasn't anyone else. Sure. He's not scoring goals, but when you've got 32 shots through just over half the game, that that's huge that, that that really tells a tale and they had all those shots because you said they're mucking it up and that's exactly what they were doing but they weren't doing it in a disciplined fashion or the rest were just calling a regular season game which I, I hope that's what they were doing i don't think they really were but like i would hope to believe that that's what it is because i would love to see that but they were giving them opportunity after opportunity because of their lack of discipline and with that they ran the power play and they were getting shots on net like you wouldn't believe uh, thankfully, Providence is a really bad power play team in the regular season, better than Bridgeport, but still not good enough. And that, that helped uh, the Bridgeport Islanders do, you know, get that win, especially in game number one. And I think that was that was another big key to our series. We said if Providence wins this series it's because their power play figured it out, like I kind of discount the way they ended the season a little bit because they were missing so many guys to Boston with injury and stuff like that. But it seemed like they were going to get enough of those pieces back to be able to have a functional power play. Obviously, that wasn't the case. <laughs> I, like I said, I expected Cam Hughes, Edwards, Tralmax, uh, and definitely Chris Wagner to play in this series. Chris Wagner, I think, went up as a black ace for Boston, which, sure, I guess. Yeah. But, like, the other two, I think, were out injured. So that's, you know, that crumbles that. I mean, they went one for 11 on the power play. And it seems like, at least from the early goings, that referees are not going to swallow the whistles in the playoffs, which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't see... I saw uh, game one. I saw bits and pieces of game two, but like nothing that I saw that was called looked like an egregious like makeup call or a phantom call. Like all of them were penalties, some a little bit on the lighter side. I think there was one like Seth Helgeson roughing or cross checking that was like, okay, yeah, he did that, but are we really going to call that? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, if you're going to stick to that standard, then fine. But yeah, uh, if if you would have told me that Providence went one for 11 on the power play in this series, I'm like, well, they lost. They did not win. <laughs> So um, also I want to point out here too, the, that this is a tale of two front offices for me. Providence has for by and large this year, kind of done the bare bones minimum to promote the team. I mean, they have very limited social media presence. Their broadcast is incredibly Spartan. And yes, oh I know God. their game was on a Monday night, but wow, that building was empty. And I feel like that didn't give, you know, the the home ice advantage boost that you would expect from a home playoff game for the Providence Bruins. Whereas Bridgeport, on the other hand, was clearly working overtime to promote the life out of this series. I don't care how many tickets that they gave away to put that many people in the stadium. I really don't. 
filling the building in the playoffs is more important to me than did they turn a giant profit because that atmosphere matters. Um, but like they, they got people to come out. That building had energy and I could not stop seeing Bridgeport on my timeline on Twitter or on Facebook or anything like that. They promoted the crap out of this game and good on their front office for clearly getting out there and doing everything they could. Whereas I, like I would say Providence didn't do that, but we don't know. They don't even have their front office staff listed on their website. So like if I needed to call someone from their office, I couldn't find who that person would be easily. That's weird. Plus like everything else that just seems very bare bones and run by like two people <laughs> is how Providence has operated the whole season. So like the fact that that was their turnout for a home playoff game, despite the fact that it's a Monday night kind of didn't surprise me, but disappointed me. Do you guys find that's kind of it, like for the AHL, just like it's two man office type of thing, or, or two person office running the show, and it's just kind of like we got one, we don't really care about it, it's there type of thing. I kind of get that feeling uh, for a few of them, just kind of like it's there. Even just like the stats, you don't have time on ice publicly. Like, what are we doing here? You can't do face off numbers either. What? Wow. Are we, the, the, none of that is publicly available, and maybe it's available somewhere, but I, I sure at least can't find it. Like, there what are, are we doing here? Yeah. And I mean, you, you uh, as far as other teams' front offices around the league go, it varies widely. I mean, there okay. are some organizations that clearly go above and beyond for just because that's their standard. Like, I mean, we look at Chicago, Utica. Mm. Uh, we just announced our best broadcast and best broadcaster, and they were two of the finalists. And those teams both very much go above and beyond what they would even, you know, need to do necessarily to make sure that they have a, a good front office, good, you know, relationship with their fans. They promote the game. Well, um, then, then you have other teams that it's just like, if I didn't follow this league as closely as I did, I might forget they were there at times. <laughs> uh, and that's like, I think the only reason I know that I'm as in tune with Hartford as I am is because their fan base is amazing, but like their front office definitely doesn't seem to put in the same amount of effort that like Utica does. They're, they're closer to Providence in that level. CC. Yeah. Yeah. Just to comment on just what I know, Colorado's front office, you know, being out here in the West and everything like they, they have a lot of folks and I'm talking from social media, you know, to merchandise. Like if you look at their website, they've got a litany of staff hmm. on the, and, and, and that's a lot of those folks are our holdovers from the CHL days, from the ECHL days. Colorado is a unicorn in the fact that they have stepped up the, uni the unilateral jump from the CHL to the ECHL, but then bumping up to the AHL from an ECHL franchise. Like, that's unheard of. So a lot of these people have been with this franchise, been with the market and everything like that. And it's it, it's just... Yeah, to hear these stories of these, you know, Northeastern franchises in the United States, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, this is the breadbasket of minor league hockey in the United States. And you're just like, meh, yeah. you know, oh, we, we got a couple guys, you know, they, yeah. they tweet stuff out occasionally. Meanwhile, Colorado Eagles have 15,000 TikTok followers Jesus. in one in less than one season. They are killing it on that regard and in and, and many other facets. But that was just an impressive number to me because mm -hmm. they launched that account at the beginning of the regular season. Now they have 15,000 followers. It's like, wow. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. yeah. So, and it's like, anyway, there, there are def you can definitely see the difference. And some of it, I think, is NHL ownership. But sometimes I think NHL ownership hurts it. Where, like, I think about Ontario and L.A. Like, I think having L.A. as their parent, you know, affiliate that also owns the team definitely benefits them. Like, they get at least some resources from LA every now and then. And it shows, whereas like, I don't think Chicago helps Rockford in that front office sense at all. Probably like if, not. any, any success that Rockford has from their front office is definitely coming from Rockford. And that's not to say they put a bad product out, but like, I think if they had more backing and more funding and more staff for, from Chicago or the, the ability to do that, they would be able to do more. Yeah. There's a limitation there. So, um, but yeah, the Bridgeport did a really good job, uh, like you said, advertising this. I know they reached out to me to like start helping them push stuff. So it wasn't just me, it was other people as well. Like they're looking to tap into the the culture of the fan base as well. And so that that's huge. And, and that's easy. It's super easy to do. Like people like me, you ask, can you retweet something? Heck yeah, I could do that. Done. What else do you want me to do? Yeah. And th like that's a, that's, that's a veteran move by them too. 
one thing we do have to discuss is that game one overtime goal. Uh, oh, yes. Like, oh, yes. I I understand why Troy Grossnick is mad. This is also not the first time, even in this playoffs, where we have a game-winning goal in overtime that is disputable. And the AHL rules do not allow video review for goaltender interference, which... And I understand after seeing all of the fun that the NHL has had with that, <laughs> but at the same point, it's like, I want to see that Troy Grosnick, you know, like it looked like from the one camera angle we got yeah. from center ice, like that looked like a very cut and dry case of clear interference and should have been a waved off goal. But like, and if you're the ref, that can be easy to miss when, you know, at just at a glance, I see puck in the net and I missed, you know, the guy, you know, sitting on top of Troy Grosnick, and there's nothing I can do about it. There is no, like, there is no mechanism to fix that. Yeah, and, so you you got to have eyes on on absolutely everything, and that that's really hard to do. I from the angle I saw, you're right. Like the angle is like they're they're filming it from down the street type of thing on like max zoom. So you're going, it kind of looks like the the Providence Bruin defense and pushes him in and holds him there. Uh, does does McLeod make a big effort to get out of the way? Not really, but you know, we, whatever. It's for the blue and orange bias over here, good goal. <laughs> and but if they could review it, that would help a whole lot. I at least think they should have the ability to review it because there there have been other goals this season where it's like there were cases where it's like that probably shouldn't have counted, but there is no review. The only thing you can review for basically is like, did the puck go in? Did the puck fully cross the line? Or like, did it go through the netting or some goofy, like something that literally will never happen. There are like right. three other cases, but it's none of them are for goaltender interference. Like, I'm fine if you don't want to do offside stuff. I'm completely understanding <laughs> because that's become its own nightmare. But like, where it's like, oh yeah, there was an offside 30 seconds earlier in the cycle and then a puck goes in. All right, fine. Well, let's, I'm, I'm okay not reviewing that at the minor league level anyway. Goaltender <laughs> interference that directly leads to a goal. Like, come on, you got to got to be able to at least look at it the the ahl needs to change that rule i think we're all in a unanimous agreement there that the ahl needs to to at least consider it in the offseason especially with you know two pivotal moments like that already in the ahl playoffs in the first round for best of three series for crying yeah. out loud they they i mean like mitch was saying they need to get more eyes uh, you know more more cameras up there more eyes on the on the p bruins for that matter but also more eyes on aisles Heck yeah. <laughs> Always eyes, more eyes on aisles, please. And thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was a very 50 50. And like the one angle we had, it was really kind of like, it looks like you could have, although you could obviously see the other side of the argument from, from Providence being like, yo guy, he's sitting on the goalie and you're not supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> um, so there, there's obviously a 50 50 there. The refs thought, uh, I'm not gonna, I can't review it. Looks like it, it went in. We're good. Let's and they got out of there, right? Like, lickety oh, split. Oh, yeah, you're you're not hanging out to ha high five the players after that one. You are getting out of, especially when it's like, well, there's nothing we can do. Like, mm -hmm. there is no review. I, I didn't see the interference or whatever the reason is, or I didn't think it was interference. That's it, it's a yeah. judgment call, and that is final as final as it gets. And if, you know, petitioning the ref after the fact like that gets him to change his mind, so you're probably in worse shape there when you get to, <laughs> you know, be disciplined from the league. But um, this series was all, like two, you know, overtime games that were two to one. The the one that b bothers me the most is a moment that's probably forgotten already by a lot of people is Providence hit the post in overtime in game one. They did. And I remember thinking to myself, like, that's it. That's the game. You know, that puck goes, you know, barred down and in. Game's over. Providence is up one nothing with a chance to take it in Bridgeport last night. You know, five minutes ish later, uh, they score. You know that goal to win, and it's like, man, that's that's a haunting moment if you're Providence of how much that series changed on a post. Yeah, it, that's all it takes, right? And that that's kind of like the Islanders' mo, right? They operate with the slimmest of margins, where if anything goes against what they're doing, everything could crumble like a house of cards. But if it doesn't, they look pretty damn good doing so. Uh, and, and that's just it. Like we, we saw that margin of error swing in their favor because they hit the post and then they were able to counter, maybe not necessarily directly, but they won that offensive zone face off. And then from there pucks in after a greasy goal, not to not, not going to lie is a greasy goal, but like that that's Bridgeport and New York Islander hockey. Yeah.
It really is. All right, Mitch, we've had some fun here. Uh, any closing thoughts on the series before uh, you head to Charlotte, which will probably not go as smoothly. Yeah, that that's really it. I'm I'm worried about what's going to happen when they face Charlotte. A, 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 clearly a much better team. Um, they aren't also lacking the same firepower that the Providence Bruins were lacking. Um, and if they approach the series and are disciplined the same way, let's just put it that way, they're not going to get out of the series. It's just not going to happen. You can't take 11 or five and a half penalties a game and expect to win sustainably. That's just not how this works. Um, they, they need, they, they also can't just rely on Corey Schneider. It's great to have him, but you can't say like, we got Corey, we're going to win. Corey Schneider's 36 years old. This could fall apart in a second. As a 38 year old, I know that very well. <laughs> we're all in our mid to late thirties and we can attest. Um, yeah, <laughs> just we'll leave it at that. If anything, the, the one big positive outside of Corey Schneider, Aturatu getting a, a goal and a, a secondary assist in overtime, two points in two games. My 19 year old man looks great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he, he was one of the few that I, I was, there were a lot of guys who were like, you know, uh, young teenage prospects who get to play in some of these opening rounds. Uh, we talk, we're going to talk about pod Coles in a little bit later. Mm. And it was like, I wasn't sure what to expect from him. Like, I'll, and the same thing with a lot of these guys, I feel like I'm telling the same story over and over where it's like, this is a 19 year old with a lot of hype coming in behind him. We're going to talk about Asgar uh, Askarov too. Mm. That's another very young kid with a mountain of hype coming behind him. But it's like, you're coming into a league that is better than the one you were in that the transition for which has tripped up many a talented player in their, you know, younger years. And you're going to do it with teammates you've never played before and a coach you've never played before, potentially a language you don't, you know, have the mastery of, mm -hmm. and you have a uh, two game, you know, best of three series as a runway to <laughs> play your best. <laughs> Good and, luck. I mean, Pod Colson had ups and downs, but uh, Atu Ratu looked as advertised, and that was at least a little surprising. But uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, mm -hmm. I just pulled the numbers too, by the way. Charlotte's net power play rank was tenth in the AHL. Their net penalty kill was second. Yeah, awesome. Like <laughs> that's not going to go well if if they try to run the same game plan. And I assume they won't. That would be really dumb if they did. Let's just do the same thing again. It's not the same team, Brent. You can't do that. <laughs> um, so I, I hope they change it up a little bit. But you can't take this. You can't run to the power or the the penalty box at the same rate against this team and expect the same result. It's just not going to happen. No, I like how not. Brent Thompson was like this imaginary sock puppet that Mitch was talking to for a second. You can't do that, Brent. Stop oh. it. <laughs> on camera, pretend. all my imaginary people are over here off camera. Let's let's not pretend for a minute that that was the first time that uh, Mitch ever yelled at Brent Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no. Oh my man, uh, he's probably not going to stick this year. I, I'd, even if they win, if they win the Calder, maybe. Oh, yeah, maybe he like gets a year. But I, I, if they don't win the Calder, I, I think they're going to make a change, which is perfectly fine. I'm glad they at least saw the year through. That's all I'm glad about. I, I don't know. I could see him winning that, making the playoffs, and winning that playoff series because Hartford collapsed and Providence was, you know, had half a team, and then being like, well. <laughs> Maybe we get like where it's like uh, if they didn't make the playoffs this year, he was a hundred percent gone. But yeah, now I sure. feel like it's like, wow, he made the playoffs. He won around. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Expanded format. Too. Yeah. When I like, heard that Bridgeport swept, I'm like, oh no, I hope this doesn't mean Brent Thompson keeps no, his it's, job. It's, I, I'm telling you, I'm calling it right now. I think there's a good chance Brent Thompson comes back. Well, next he's like, nah. <laughs> well, why did you bring me here up. then? He's <laughs> he's like. He, he reminds me of Gar Snow, where people are openly wondering out loud, does he have a contract for life? Yeah, uh, he might. He just might, like, leave it to uh, Charles Wong to do exactly that, right? Oh, my. Oh, my. All right, Mitch. It's been a lot of fun. I'm sure we will be talking to you again uh, at some point in the Charlotte series. So uh, we will be having you back then. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, if you guys board. are Islanders fans out there or Bridgeport Sound Tiger fans even, and you are uh, not subscribed to Eyes on Isles, I don't know what you're doing with your life. It's a great podcast. Mitch does excellent work. You can also see his YouTube channel on deck, uh, called Deck Hands that uh, is very good. We've definitely stolen an idea or two from you there uh, and repurposed it as our own. Awesome. So, uh, any place else people can find you, Mitch, that I have forgotten. Twitter at TLO Mitch. I don't have any other social media. I don't do Instagram. I don't do TikTok because 
I'm old, not really, but kind of, and I just don't like doing them because I don't get it. <laughs> They're not for me. So that's it. That's all you can get from me. That's very fair. That's probably a smart move. <laughs> fair all enough. Right, all right. We had another series wrap up this week in the AHL. We already covered one. Now it's time to cover the other. And so our next guest has over a decade of journalistic experience. He's currently the sports editor for the Abbotsford News in Abbotsford, British Columbia, and he also co-hosts the Abbotsford Farm podcast. Uh, this is his first time, however, on this farmstead here of the Calder variety. So please welcome to the show, Ben Lipka. Ben? Hey. First time on the show. Thanks for coming in. That was an excellent introduction. You, know, you made me sound kind of old, though, with the 10 years thing. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, hey, you're, right, you're not wrong. It has been 10 years. It's been 10 years. But hey, thanks for the introduction. Really happy to be here, guys. Thanks for the invite. A Absolutely. seasoned veteran in the journalism. <laughs> <laughs> that sure. that would have been better. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. 10 years is good. Okay. All right. Well, yes, Bakersfield and Abbotsford. Uh, Bakersfield snatching that home ice advantage from Abbotsford before this series started. Or, or maybe Abbotsford snatching defeat from the jaws of victory is a better analogy um, in regards to the two losses against Manitoba. But hey, let's talk about this first round series. Game one, Abbotsford at Bakersfield, Tuesday, May 3rd. Bakersfield winning 2-1 to one in overtime. Game two, another one goal affair. Another affair in Bakersfield, Wednesday, May 4th. And Bakersfield winning that one as well, 3-2 to two, to close out the best of three series. It's just like puff of yeah. smoke. That's it. And, yeah. and here we are, we're on the other side of it. And, and Ben, we're going to talk our picks real quick because sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sean got it right. However, I was pretty high on Abbotsford, yeah. but yeah, I picked the Abbey Knox. Sean said he'd take Bakersfield because home ice advantage matters and Abbotsford somehow got screwed out of it. And the model <laughs> also picked Bakersfield with a 52% favorite. Um, yes. So now we open up the floor for discussion because, uh, <laughs> How much time do we got? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. as much as you could spare. Yeah. This is this is one of those where I just, I mean, the entire Pacific is doing the like one team gets to host the games, and I, I want to say my little bit here of I don't get that. We expanded the playoff field to add all these extra teams, and then only like one or two of them are getting home games. Like to me, this has always been a, a cash grab thing. Your teams needed playoff revenue so that they could make up for last year. I, you know what? I'm willing to let that one go. We'll do this. But then you don't give them home games. And I'm just like, well, if your travel costs are greater than what you would expect <laughs> to net profit from the playoff game hosting at home, then why did you expand the playoff in the first place? Yeah, what are we I, even doing? I mean, I, and you know, it's funny. A lot of, uh, a lot of Abbotsford fans, I don't think they knew about this. So, and a lot of fans were just completely confused. Like we don't have any games. It's, you know, just two games and we're out. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, my my take is everyone agreed to this. So, I don't know. It's not a big surprise. Uh, so, I, I don't know. I don't I don't see any teams complaining, but it does, for a fan, it kind of sucks. Like, I think it's kind of frustrating. It's really quick. You have a really long season, and then just to end it in two one-goal games really fast, no home games. It sucks for the fans, but, I mean, they all agreed to this, so I, I can't really complain about the format. That's what the, That's what they wanted, right? Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. Like, to me, it, it's, and I understand they that, like, all the, you know, the front offices agreed to this because you can't just strong arm schedule half, you know, half a team. But, like, that's, I, I, I'm still confused. It's like, you built this so that you could build more revenue for these extra playoff teams and <laughs> you don't give them a home game. And it's like, what did they get out of this? Yeah. What was their, but, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Apparently, so. Cause it's not like you're going to let those teams, like there's no way a team that hosted is like, yep, we're going to share that playoff home ticket. <laughs> yeah. No way that happened. Yeah. So on the ice though, I mean, we said in our preview, I I've thought Abbotsford in my viewings of them this season is at its absolute peak of its powers when it can fly through the neutral zone and do fast break rush chances when it yeah. has, you know, Jack Rathbone hit and stretch passes to Nick Batan halfway through the neutral zone and they can counter attack like that. And while Bakersfield had that ability somewhat in, in you know their their season, they were much better as a rough and tumble kind of team, and they had a huge size advantage. And that was the way in which I thought they were going to win this series, playing heavy hockey. Yeah, and that's what it looked like to me. Not you know 
as dominant a physical performance, but they were the more physical team. And and I and I think that was kind of Abbotsford's decision to play Bakersfield's game. Like Abbotsford, they left a lot of talent sitting on upstairs. They didn't dress Danila Klimovich. They played Jet Wu, who's the defenseman, who's one of the Canucks' better defensive pro- prospects. He's playing forward for some reason. Um, so I think, and, you know, they dressed Vincent Arsenault for the first time in, in over a month he played. And he was, you know, he was effective. He was, you noticed him out there. But, like, they should have played their game. They have a lot of skill. They have a lot of speed. Um and they didn't take advantage of that. Like they played the Bakersfield game. They allowed Bakersfield, they wanted, they allowed Bakersfield to kind of dictate the game. And I just, I thought they should have went the other way and try and win with skill. If you can't win with skill, then, then try and goon it up a bit, but, uh, or make it a little bit rougher, but they just went right into Bakersfield's game. And I just, especially game one, like there was no offense. Like they had like how many shots they were outshot horribly. Was, oh yeah. It was like, it was um, 47 to 31, but that first period, it was 20 to seven. Like it was all Bakersfield and yeah. nothing was generated. So like, yeah, it was frustrating to watch. Spencer Martin played, like they wasted an incredible Spencer Martin performance. <laughs> they absolutely and, did. So, and in a seven game series, you can get away with that. But in a three game series, no, you, have yeah, it, you have to take advantage of a performance like that. So yeah, the first game was pretty frustrating. We also had Paul Colson as the X factor in the series. And I feel like that's definitely something we got right because like, and I I said in the preview, I'm not going to mince words. Pod Colson is very, very good. He is going to be a very, very good NHLer. Yeah. But like, he's still very young. Didn't get a lot of ice time in Vancouver. And there were, there was a reasonable concern that he would come in, you know, on one practice, basically a new, you know, teammates he's (laughs) barely played with in Vancouver, if at all a coaching staff that's unfamiliar to him and have, you know, one, maybe two practices to kind of pick up the timing and the flow of things in a, you know, runway that is exactly two games. There was a, there was a very real chance that he wouldn't be the the dominant player that we know he can be. And I think that kind of came through, like he looked great offensively, but there were definitely moments on defense where I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's not really what you're supposed to be doing there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, I follow a lot of Vancouver Canucks fans on social media. And, you know, the, the second that uh, Pod Colson, it was announced that he was papered down and he was going to join the team, like, the <laughs> Canucks fans were basically like, let's plan the Calder Cup parade. Like, they thought that this guy, <laughs> he's going to dominate the AHL. He's just going to go down there and you know, he's going to score a hat trick every single game and he's going to do whatever he wants down there. And like, he was good. He was effective. Like he, he produced, he did everything they asked of him, but like, and I think what Vancouver fans and Abster fans do need to realize the AHL is not an easy league. This is a tough league. It's not, uh, <laughs> it's not an easy league. So you, even a superstar player, and he's not even a superstar player yet in the NHL, a superstar player couldn't even go down to the AHL and dominate. So I thought he did. I was impressed with him. He, he looked really good. He played well with Rempel. Um, so no complaints. Like Pod Colson was uh, was as advertised, but he can only do so much. Like he's not going to make a difference in a series, especially a short series. And w- when he's has probably no chemistry with any of these guys that he's he's been slotted with. Yeah, I think if you would have given him like – so Hershey had basically two weeks off from their last game of the regular season to their first uh, – to game one, which I think is still a couple days away – and if you would have given, if you would have sent Pod Colson down with that much runway to get in practices, to you know get in some scrimmages, a little more live fire with the team, I yeah. think we would have be having a, di- I'd be, we'd be having a different discussion about the outcome of this series. At the minimum, I think it at least goes to three games. Yeah. Um, if Abbotsford gets a home game, I think this goes to three <laughs> games too. But yeah. that's that's a story for another time. Yeah. I also think too that you know we we talked about the Condors playing physical and being the heavier team, but that they needed to stay out of the box. And Abbotsford's power play struggled down the stretch, but their power play one unit is what Rempel, Patan, Pod Colson, uh, Rathbone, and Dries. Yeah, yeah. I yep. want no part of that if I was Bakersfield. And yeah. staying out of the box is a big key for them. They took three penalty or gave up three power plays in uh, yeah. per game, which is down from their 4.3 they took during the regular season. So, like, to me, that's another box check that the Condors did is not getting in the actual box. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, totally right there. Yeah, they did, they did a good job of that. And just Abbotsford, like, especially in game one, they made it easy offensively. Like, 
just the way that Trent Cole used his lineup was a little interesting. Like we had the the two Sheldons who've been a dominant duo. They've played together the entire year. Uh, they've been effective. Like they're the two of the top leading scorers on Abbotsford. And for some reason, he decided to split them up to get Pod Colson in, I guess. I have no clue what that was about. And then he never decided to put them back together. It's like when we're heading into the third period and they're, they're, they need a goal, I was like, I was just thinking like, let's, let's get desperate here. Like we need the Sheldons back together. Let's get some offense going. And um, so, yeah, he did a lot of curious, a lot of curious decisions as far as how he used his lineup. Um, I, I was on uh, another podcast earlier in the week and I actually suggested pairing uh, Pog Colson and Klimovich together. I just wanted to see that. I thought it would have been entertaining to watch, but obviously Klimovich didn't dress, but uh, yeah, it's just offensively, especially in game one, like it was, nothing was happening. Like really nothing was happening. And I, I think this was at least a, a, a possible example of Trent Cole trying to outthink himself. It, yeah. Like he, and he, him and Abbotsford in general have done a great job with that staff this year. Um, they, they have really overcome a lot of just last minute call-ups and injuries and, and turned, you know, what has been at times a skeleton crew into one that can still pull, you know, points off, uh, into the standings. So yeah. It, it was really surprising when I saw some, those lineups to see some of the choices he made. Like I know Jet Wu has been sprinkled in as a fourth line forward yeah. here and there, yeah. a choice that I'm still baffled by. But like <laughs> Monte Stevens did the same thing at points in the year where he played a little bit of forward. And it's yeah. like, well, I guess when you're in a pinch and you don't want to run 7D, this is what you do. But like yeah. you had other choices here, it seemed like. Yeah. I, yeah. I had no problem with Jet Wu playing forward like during the season. Like it's, he's a, he's a pretty good skater. It's just his, he thinks like a defenseman. Like I just don't think like he doesn't think offensively he's, he's no. physical. So as far he brings that, as far as that, he brings a physical game, which is good, but he's got like zero offensive touch. Like he just, he doesn't know where to be in front of the net. Like he's no net presence. And he was a negative three in the series. And I know people don't like plus minus as far as the stat goes, but if you're a third, you're a third liner, and you're a negative three. They only scored four even strength goals. How is how is that possible? Like I, I was confused by that. Like the guy's just not a fit as a forward. So I would, and yeah, I, I it, like he has two. He has another year on his ELC too, and yeah. like I know he's still young, but it's like he needed to be taking leaps this season to show yes. that he could possibly make the NHL. I could very much see after next season if he's still in the same place he is this season or hasn't moved far enough that the Canucks yeah. walk away from him. And he's someone too, that our biggest criticism with him hasn't changed throughout the season. Like we've seen a lot of guys when we point out something that's wrong with their game, they grow on it at least a little bit. Like we're not masterminds of the world here. If we see something <laughs> that you're doing wrong, it's probably something you notice too. Yeah. But for us, it was always Jet Wu turning attacking pucks into possession pucks. We're like, if there's a guy, you know, on your back, like a backpack and you have possession of the puck, you're just trying to get the, uh, the puck to a teammate that can continue the play so you have possession but like he would take pucks that were ones where he had time he had mm -hmm. time and space and could attack and try mm -hmm. and create a scoring chance and he would treat it like a possession puck where he's just yeah. putting making the play to a teammate that's safe yeah and that's panicky. not he's he was panicky at times yeah as, as a defenseman yeah, yeah. Definitely. and like he yeah. plays he defends the rush well he plays yeah. in zone pretty well but like you're only going to go so far in professional hockey if at this level you can't create offense when you have time and space like yeah if i'm vancouver i see that and i'm like well that's a dude who's going to be a defensive defenseman for his ahl career because yeah. if you can't make offense at the ahl level you're not going to be able to manufacture <laughs> the nhl level yeah and a, a guy who puts up three assists in six defenseman minutes is not something that exists at the nhl level anymore yeah. so like and, and that's why and that's why why do, why does that guy play forward that's what i don't understand I don't know. <laughs> why there, do you put that guy forward there, in a there playoff are, game a must win playoff game yeah. that's your best choice to play like that's yeah, what i didn't understand I, th this is one of those ones where i hadn't really questioned trent call the entire season like i thought yeah. he made pretty well informed choices did a lot of good things as a coach and then suddenly it's like he he decided to get cute in the playoffs and yeah. in in those moments you you like don't don't get cute. This is yeah. a this is there is not enough runway here for you to get cute. You should have just rolled the same lineup you rolled yeah. when everyone was healthy in Abbotsford in December or whenever. Like that's and, what and the and the Klimovich thing. It's like that. What I I just don't understand. He plays almost the entire season. Playoffs come and you don't want to play him. I mean, 
you won with this guy for a lot of games. He produced pretty decently for an 18 or 19 year old. Like, I don't know. I was, he definitely um, struggled down the stretch. Like he was almost invisible the last five or six games, but um, you know, I, the, the name of the game is development in this league. So what are we doing if we're not developing a second round pick who's 18? He's, he's there for a reason. So if you're going to lose, lose with these skilled guys, that that's, you're trying to develop them. That's the bottom line. And I just, I didn't understand sitting him for both games. I mean, maybe game one, you want to leave him out, but if you lose a game in the playoffs, like I think you need to make changes and especially if it's a must win game. Yeah, it's it's a must win game and you're not going to be able to bank on like, oh, well, if we at least pull this one out, we have a home game to, you know, yeah. like you, you, that, that was definitely a moment where you needed to make lineup changes. And if it's a back to back. Else, it's a back to back too. Yeah, guys could be tired. Or, like I just didn't understand not making us one single change. Yeah. From the Condor side too, like they were impressive to me. I did not expect them to come out and put on four out of six pretty dominant periods. Like yeah. that was genuinely something I was not expecting. I thought this would be a very close fought uh, speed versus power kind of series. And Bakersfield took over at times in a way that was surprising to me. And if I'm, you know, uh, Stockton or whoever makes it the next round and I'm watching Bakersfield play, I'm not feeling great about my chances suddenly. Like, yeah, like I always thought, I thought Bakersfield was one of the better teams. Like they've got, they've got a lot of guys who are just, <laughs> I think they'd be annoying to play against like Esposito, for example, like that guy, he's just a great pest. Like he's a, he's a lot of fun to watch and yeah, they have some high end skill. Like they have, um, Griffiths put up a ton of points. Um, and even um, Cooper Marodi, I liked him a lot. Hamblin's another guy. He doesn't seem like he's a lot of fun to play against either. So, yeah, they got a lot of talent there. And um, I was always kind of surprised that they were – I thought Bakersfield was one of the better teams in the division, to be honest. And I think they're built for that heavy playoff hockey that has yeah. been more uh, in vogue recently. Yeah. Like, there are a lot of ways to win playoff games. There are a lot of ways to, you know, uh, skin a cat, but like Bakersfield has definitely chosen a lane. Like they are a big physical team, but they aren't devoid. Like they don't goon it up. Like they're yeah. very much still a, a, a talented team, but they're a big talented team and they're capable of grinding you down. Totally. I think that's going to be a good recipe if they play Colorado in the next round, assuming Colorado advances. I think that's going to be a good recipe if they play Ontario in the next round, assuming Ontario advances, which I hope they don't. I need to look smart. But, uh, <laughs> he picked uh, the goals. Oh, yeah. Really? Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my my reaction, exactly. Every, yeah. Everyone's reaction was really. <laughs> yeah. It's huh. for like 10 minutes into that first game, I looked like a genius. <laughs> Yeah, and no, then, I, I actually like Ontario a lot, especially I, I like them earlier in the year. We, I kind of, they played Abbotsford a bunch earlier in the year, and I thought they were actually really good. And I haven't really been following them super closely, but I know they, they do have a lot of talent. Like, oh, no, they a have a lot of talent, talent. but it's for me, I, I strictly chose San Diego because I think San Diego's goaltender and Lucas Dostal is capable of stealing a series. He's right. shown flashes of it, but he hasn't able, really had the the consistency to to really kind of have that coming out party and but ontario's goalie and matthew Villalta has been i like him a lot actually not, like i think he has a lot of good raw tools but yeah. he has not put them together and has struggled for a second oh, okay. straight season and it's mm -hmm. like i don't trust him <laughs> in a two in a two game series i want to believe more in the goaltender who i think can steal a series versus the one who I'm wondering if he's not the reason they lose. So I took San Diego strictly on that measure. And for like 10 minutes in the first period when San Diego was up to nothing, I looked real smart. <laughs> and then the next, you know, 50 minutes happened. And well, let's hope. Anyway, <laughs> uh, one thing I do want to talk about before we wrap it up here with the series, um, game winning goal. Yeah. You know, it was in Hamblin. Yeah. Go ahead. That was garbage. Like <laughs> that shouldn't have counted. Like, and I know, you know, Abbotsford may, they probably would have lost the series anyway. Like that's just, they weren't the uh, Bakersfield was the better team through yeah. most of the series. But like when we were watching on AHL TV, it didn't, it just looked like a kind of a mad scramble at the front. And then the puck somehow went in, like we didn't actually have the best angle. And then, uh, yeah, later on when you saw it, like <laughs> it was ridiculous. Like, um, Lucas Sevich gets uh, pushed into Martin. The puck's there, um, and Marodi scores. Like I, 
I don't know how that counted. Like, uh, yeah, it's like, it ridiculous. I'm like, okay, I can see a world in which you can call that not goaltender interference because Martin was probably not getting back. But yeah. like, he still cross checked the dude. Like, yeah. that's yeah. definitely still, you can't just be two handing <laughs> guys in the yeah. lower back in the front of the net. Like, yeah, that's into the goalie. So it's just, I, I thought that goal, that was ridiculous. Like, I, that just shouldn't have counted. Like, no, it, it and I mean, the refs, I, the, I thought the refs were fine throughout the whole series, but like, I, especially looking back like i can see why martin was freaking out there because i mean <laughs> what are you supposed to do like how is that fair i, yeah. I thought that was ridiculous and this uh, and we talked about this earlier in the show because bridgeport scored an overtime game winning goal in game one against providence on what probably should have been called goal sender interference but oh, okay was that, i didn't not, see that one was that worse than this one it's or, it's hard to tell because yeah. uh, providence has exactly one camera oh. and <laughs> like Love you it. could see just from the broadcast view what was clearly a, a battle at the net front that kind of spilled into the crease where Grosnick was. And gro at, like right before, it's a wraparound goal from behind. Yeah. And you just see Grosnick like sitting in the actual net oh, and God. they score. And he's like freaking out to the referee like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I think he actually broke a, si a Bud Light sign over the exit uh, in Providence's arena because he slammed his <laughs> stick into it afterward. But it's like yeah. – According to the AHL rules, goaltender interference is not reviewable as a reason for overturning a goal, which should not be the case. Like, I understand you don't want to do offside reviews. You've seen how much fun the NHL has had with yeah. that. And goaltender interference is still something that it feels like is a wishy-washy kind of decision. I'm a Pittsburgh Penguins fan myself. I thought for sure that the goal that uh, uh, was going to win the Rangers the game with like two minutes left in the third period, I was like, that shouldn't count, but it's probably going to. And then it mm -hmm. got overturned. We went to triple overtime and won. Yeah. But like, I understand the kind of uh, crunchiness of what goalie interference is versus isn't, but to not be allowed to review that is just <laughs> yeah. like, you should, <laughs> you should at least be able to look at it. Like, and, the, and it, the, the funny thing was the condor, like the condors tweeted, they tweet out the video Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like, do you guys not see what's going on here? I mean, oh, I'm sure I, I thought that was hilarious. I'm sure they didn't care because they know there's nothing. That yeah, can it's over. Like, yeah, it's, it's over. over. But like, yeah. once the ref calls it a goal on the ice, there yeah. is nothing that can be done. Yeah, and yeah, like that's that's silly to me. Oh like, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought that goal was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But and it, the fact that it's like we're you know a week into the playoffs and we've had two overtime de game deciding and a series deciding goal on goals that yeah. it's like eh, could have been <laughs> called back even if you yeah. were the biggest bakersfield condors fan you have to realize like okay you can see a world in which that goal shouldn't have counted like yeah. if you're a bridgeport fan you could see a world in which that goal shouldn't have counted but here we are and there's nothing like if it would have gone the other way the other side would have been screaming bloody murder and it's like we yeah we shouldn't be, you know, resigned to a bang bang play like that, and the refs' judgment call and uh, something that happens in a quarter of a second. Like, yeah, this isn't 1984. Exactly, and I'm not like I'm not saying uh, like Bakersfield absolutely would have come back and won the series, but yeah, I just thought that goal was, was yeah. trash. That's that's not the way you want to have your series decided ever. Yeah. Like. I always root when we go into overtime games like that. I'm like, just give me a clean ending. Like if I don't have a team that I'm pulling for, just please don't get me mired down in 10 yeah. months of, well, Brett Hull's foot was in the crease. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> not Wash 10 months. Up. We're talking 23 yeah. years now, Sean. Oh. Sabres fans will not let that go. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the unfortunate thing is that that goal, and I, I, maybe it hasn't, but I, a lot of fans, it felt like after a really fun season, like this was a great season, I think, for the Absurd Canucks overall for debut season. Oh, yeah. Uh, the fans were there. We have, you know, the arena was rocking when, as soon as fans could attend games. Uh, attendance was pretty solid overall. Um, so to end the season on that kind of a sour note was pretty disappointing. And it kind of was like, I think people were pretty disappointed about just, okay, is this the way this league operates? I, yeah. I don't know that's, if I like that. That's, but, that's the other thing too, is yeah. like, because especially in a, a town, like, you know, being that close to the, the home market in Vancouver or like how Bridgeport is with New York Islanders, a lot of the, you know, the NHL side of the fans until their team gets knocked out of the playoffs or is done playing, like the AHL is like a thing they're casually aware of. Yeah. So for, you know, what is a return to the AHL, a return to that market for the AHL after years, mm -hmm. like, there were a lot more eyeballs on you in this one. And you probably turned a lot of people off because that was their first exposure is like, wow, we played 
two games and <laughs> didn't get a home game. We got yeah. kind of jobbed in, you know, on the game yeah. winning goal. Like, yeah. is this what this league is? And yeah. that's not a, that's not how you want to be introducing yourself to, you know, a, a big market of, of fans, but. And Canucks fans have paranoia about the refs anyways. <laughs> For decades, so this didn't help anything. It's like, yeah. oh, this so we get screwed in this league too. Okay, let's get the towels out again or whatever. You know, <laughs> so that didn't help. That did not help anything. And 2011, 1982, 94. Yeah. There's been some traumatic experience with Canuck fans. This doesn't rank up there at all, but it was just no, it felt but... like it felt like more of the same. It's the underlying trauma that <laughs> foundation where it's like, ah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's lingering. I got it. Yeah, lingering. That's a great word for it. <laughs> All right, Ben, any closing thoughts here before uh, we move on to some other previews that we have to get to because this league schedules things in weird ways? Yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say, like, you know, it might have been a disappointing end, but uh, overall, uh, like, I do think this was a positive year for the Canucks organization. It was a great thing for Abbotsford to have a team back and to have a team that they care about. Like, they, we, we just don't care about Calgary Flames prospects. That's just, it's not going to happen. So to have the Vancouver Canucks prospects in uh, Vancouver's backyard, um, yeah, it created a lot. It created a big buzz. I think it's going to be even bigger next year when more fans will be able to attend. Uh, all the COVID restrictions will be will hopefully be gone. Um, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, overall, it was an excellent year. Like a lot, of the the team performed well. A lot of support. Um, and a lot of fun. And yeah, what what, did you, what, what, what about uh, your guys' impression? Like from just the Abbotsford franchise from, from what you hear. Definitely. We don't hear a lot up here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, definitely a rocky start, uh, yeah. but I feel like they managed to find, you know, their way pretty quickly. Like I was definitely concerned when I saw the Canucks 2014, like fashion jerseys as the default. Like that was a moment where I'm like, you had so much potential here and you were yeah. just, and it felt like the entire time that they ran out of time and ran yeah. out of runway and were just like, oh God, we have to staff this team and uh, put out a jersey and <laughs> yeah. we have like three days. Shit. Uh, go into storage <laughs> and look for anything that says Johnny Canuck on it. <laughs> so like from those very uh, awkward beginnings, I really do feel like the, like, like you said, it was a good season in terms of like building a fan base, building uh, up uh, a good, you know, uh, a good fan culture. Like mm -hmm. there, your, your guys fans have been, very entertaining. Uh, a little overactive, if anything else. I, I think okay. a lot yeah. of my a lot of my notifications uh, uh, come from Abbotsford fans of just posts of anything Canucks related. Period. Yeah. Which yeah. has been a little overwhelming at times. <laughs> I, I definitely at least see the passion from the fan base, and it, it is it, it definitely is going to be one of the more standout uh, franchises I think in the very near future because they they certainly seem to have found their sea legs and are. I'm looking forward to see what they can do next year with a, a little more runway and a little more preparation and the ability to be able to have, you know, a raucous full house every night. Yeah. And just a little background, like uh, Jim Rutherford did hold a press conference uh, earlier this week. And it, from what he's saying anyway, like they're going to be upgrading the, the dressing rooms possibly sometime this summer and they want to keep this a very competitive team. So I know they loaded up on a lot of veterans for this first year. Um, and it sounds like that's going to be the plan going forward. Like they want this to be a marquee AHL franchise. They're going to put a lot of care into, into building and growing the team. And I mean, it seems like that's what exactly what they've been doing so far. So hopefully, you know, we'll see if that continues, but the first year, you, uh, definitely a thumbs up, I would say. And Ben, um, from the, the back end of things, like when Abbotsford came to town yeah. and um, I, I had the chance to interview Spencer Martin, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I literally, it was 10 25, the, the Canucks team was eating their post game meal in the dining area. And I'm running downstairs because I'd already interviewed, you know, coach Cronin of Colorado and another player. And I ran back upstairs to, to start typing my game recap. And I'm, I'm, you know, track of time. I'm like, Oh, I got to get down there and see if I can grab Spencer Martin. So I run down there and I just grab one of the Abbotsford guys, not literally, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I grabbed one of the guys in the suits and I said, Hey, um, can I interview Spencer Martin real quick? It's only going to take three minutes. He goes, okay, it better be three minutes because we're getting on the bus in five. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I grab my recorder. I start recording. I'm asking him questions and everything like that. 
and it's like two minutes and 56 seconds on my recorder. I'm like, Whew. wow. All right, go catch your nice. bus, Spencer. Thank you so much. So just the, the fact that they were willing to be like, oh yeah, I mean, we've got a bus to catch, but let me go yeah. grab them real quick. I mean, that was a uh, kind of a, uh, like, oh, well, this isn't my job, but let me, let me go take care of it for you. That's so cool. I thought that that kind of, um, I don't know, kind of a utility <laughs> attitude, like I'll do this, even though it's not my job. I was impressed by that. Sounds like you get better access than I do. Cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm just kidding. They've been pretty good for that, but uh, okay, that's good. I'm like, I don't, I can't speak on that, Ben. I don't know. <laughs> that was just a joke, but yeah, no, okay, it's uh, the organization's been awesome to deal with. Like, this is kind of uh, it, like I've never covered a pro team. I've covered lots of junior teams, so um, pro hockey team, anyway. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, let's just, like I said before, let's just hope uh, they can keep the momentum going for for this upcoming season. Yeah, if their plan is to stock the stock the team with veterans that are going to help them win games and score goals, I mean, every AHL team every year has that opportunity because it's just a uh, you know yeah. every year we see Chicago sign you know yeah. nine high profile free agents, so the will is definitely out there to make that happen. And yeah, so uh, if that's their plan, I I think it's going to be a fun one at least. Yeah. Ben, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Real quick, where can people find your work? Yeah, um, the best way to find out all my work is just follow me on Twitter. It's at Ben Lipka. That's L-Y-P-K-A. Or you can go to abbynews.com and that's where we go to the sports section. We have all sorts of Canucks stuff. Um, I don't just cover the games. Like I cover some of the business aspects of the team. Um, so yeah, all sorts of in-depth coverage there. Check it out at uh, abbynews.com. All right, Ben, thank you so much for coming on. We will have to have you back at some point uh, to talk about the Abbotsford Canucks. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you so easy. much, Ben. Appreciate it. All right, Ben Lipka from the Abbotsford News. And uh, we're going to use that to, to segue into our break because we've got a couple series to preview because the AHL's uh, minor league hockey scheduling is – a little wacky. Yeah. So, <laughs> Doesn't make it, sense, but here we are. But yeah, here we are. We're, uh, we're going to take a break here. If you're just here to hear us recap these two series, thank you so much for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe if you're ever listening to us from so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, make sure you follow us on social media. We have a lot of fun there. We uh, post some memes. We have a good time. Um, you can find all of the links to that and more at our Linktree page at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash the Calder Farmstead. Want to run some ads, pay some bills. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. All right, so we are back from break, and it's time to break down some series because uh, apparently we're going to do the first round and the second round simultaneously because minor league hockey scheduling. Got to love it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the AHL brass watched uh, Into the Spider-Verse and were like, how can we build multiple worlds at the same time into our AHL scheduling? Because that's what this feels like. We're playing games that should be happening in the future in the present <laughs> yeah yeah we're we're i mean it's it's no coincidence that dr strange uh is in theaters today so in yeah. the multiverse of madness which is exactly is, what we're dealing what with is. that yes. might be our episode title i you know it, it's make it so make it so all right so here we are round two syracuse number two in the north division against laval number three game one friday may 6th at syracuse 7 p.m Game two, Saturday, May 7th at Syracuse, 7 p.m. Game three, Thursday, May 12th at Laval, 7 p.m. If necessary, game four will be Saturday, May 14th at Laval at 3 p.m. And if necessary, game five will be Tuesday, May 17th. They will go back to Syracuse at 7 p.m. All times Eastern. That's All not right. a bad schedule either. Like in terms yeah. of, you know, for a minor league five game series, you know, you got a back to back, but then you have some travel days in there. That's really embracing the yeah we don't care just throw the games wherever we can squeeze them in there logic in a minor league hockey economy <laughs> my pinned tweet very much displays uh the logic of the ahl it's brilliant yes but let's talk about uh the teams and get this preview on the road here syracuse well uh they wrapped up the season 41 and 35 good for a 599 points percentage the last 10 games of the season, eight and two. So coming into the playoffs hot. Net power play uh, was 14.7%. That was 24th in the league. Net penalty kill uh, was 82.3%. That is 21st in the AHL. If the Syracuse Crunch are going to win, their special teams stayed hot. Now, because we just 
literally talked about three sentences ago. Uh, th- those special teams numbers don't sound impressive from the season long view, but in their last five games to end the season, though, 26.3% net power play, 86.4 net penalty kill. Those are big boy numbers. Laval also gave up the fewest power, pl- uh, the eighth fewest power plays per game in the regular season, though, which makes the chances that the crunch gets to, you know, flex the power play uh, seven times a game, not that likely making what they do on the power play all the more important because they're not likely to get to use it that much. So when they do get a power play, they need to make it count. If the crunch are going to win this series, they need their power play to produce and they need their penalty kill to at least perform uh, at an above average clip. Like they need it to be closer to that 86 than in the eight, in the low eighties. If they win the Syracuse crunch, uh, then Max Legasse outdoed Kevin Poulin. I think this ser- series is very likely going to come down to which goalie made the last save. Um, Poulin has carried the ball shoot through some thin times this season and has balled out in the process. Max Legasse, while his season wasn't spectacular on the whole, he got white hot down the stretch and finished the season on an absolute tear. He posted a 943 save percentage since Patty's day. In those 16 games, he allowed more than two goals just four times and zero times in his last seven games. Max Legasse is feeling himself right now. And while Kevin Poulin's career resume may not be on the same level as Max Legasse's at this point, he's been lights out this season. And if the Crunch win this series, they're going to need Legasse to win this goaltender's duel. That's the crunch side, uh, an abbreviated version, as we learned that this series was starting tomorrow about 2 p.m. today. So unfortunately, we haven't been able to do the the deepest dive that we would have liked, but I still feel like we, you know, are hitting the right points here. Cece, tell me about the other side, um, preferably in English, but if you can do both sides, that would be great. Um, English Spanish is is my bilingual ness. That's about the extent of it. So sorry. Not not French, but uh, I will. I'll break it down for you in English. How did they get here? Season record thirty nine and thirty three point five nine zero points percentage. Last ten games five and five, right down the middle. Net power play and rank sixteen percent even, good for nineteenth out of the thirty one teams in the AHL. Net penalty kill and rank eighty five point nine percent kill rate, top ten percentage. That was good for seventh. Now, if the Rocket win, it is because couple different things here. One, Sammy Niku finds his game. Now, Niku is another guy on Laval who probably shouldn't be in the AHL. First 11 games with the Rocket, he had seven points. And he's had six points in his last 25 games. Xavier Ouellette is good and can move the puck. Belpedio has ability, but Niku is the only potential game breaker. And that's what Laval needs him to be to win this series. We've not gotten the best look at Laval this season, and it's not because we haven't watched or covered them. It's because when we have covered them, they've just had some plum bad luck. (laughs) They were 1-8 and when featuring them in games this season. I think they got that one. Wasn't that the last game that we covered them in? No, I think it was one of the early ones. I'm pretty sure they got swept in the last series we covered them this year, but I could be wrong about that. That's okay. It was a long season, and now we're on the home stretch. So in the postseason here. Anyways, in those games, Laval looked atrocious in their own end, defending passes to the high danger areas. Syracuse isn't a team that wastes pucks in the offensive zone. They're going to attack the slot, and if Laval is going to win this series, they're going to need to defend the slot better than they have in some of their poor showings in the past. Because a best of five is still a shorter series. It's not a best of three like that first round there, but best of five, still a short series. You don't have the runway to be giving up a game where you just played poorly on defending home plate. They've got to shore that up. And again, with a, a short run runway, not a not a best of three runway, but a best of five. Yeah, you still can't be throwing games away there where you yeah. just came Mark out. Margin errors you... then, yeah. yeah. X factor for the series. Um, it's hard to pick just one player. So I'm going to say star power showdown here because both sides have guys that don't belong in this league on the roster. Uh, Syracuse has Alex Barry Boulay. He does not belong in the AHL. Laval has Cedric Paquette, uh, who very clearly does not belong in the AHL. Both sides have guys that look like they're on the precipice of making the NHL and wouldn't shock me to see them be on a game one uh, roster when we come to October. Syracuse's Gabriel Fortier and Sean Day. 
Lavaz, Raphael Harvey, Pinard, and Jesse Ullinen. This series isn't going to be won by depth scores and third line grinders getting greasy goals. This is going to be won by the top of one lineup showing that their best is better than their counterparts' best. Their stars are gonna, the stars are going to be shining bright here. That's your X factor. Which one's stars shine the brightest? Now, it's time for the picks. <laughs> I will go first per usual, and I will say April 30th, transaction sheet, Riley Nash brought up to Tampa Bay. No Riley Nash for Syracuse is a concern. It's a big concern for them. So, in my opinion, skyrockets in flight. Delice de la primidi. Ah, delice de la primidi. There was a little French there. Thank you, Google Translate. That means afternoon delight in France for those keeping track at home. I've debated this one a lot. This is a series between two teams that I think are dark horses to come out of the Eastern Conference, period. Like... I, I don't think anyone in the Atlantic wins the, the East. I think it's going to be who wins the North. So I'm I'm real close here, but I, I'm i going to lean Syracuse. But God, it's close. I think the games we've covered for Laval may be biasing me a little bit here, but I've seen Laval get tripped up against teams they should clobber, where Syracuse has seemed to find a way to take care of business when maybe they don't play their best game. And again... I think, you know, the games we've covered, Laval may be shading my my process here, but I'm I'm going to take Syracuse by a millimeter. I think this is a game that's going to feature, that's going all five, and it's going to feature a lot of OT. And you even use the metric system, which kudos to you for that. Ah! <laughs> oh, well, that's one series. There's another series starting on, on. Friday. Oh, oh, I, here I go again. Jumping the gun. My apologies. The model has Laval as a 50.8% favorite <laughs> over Syracuse. So the again, even the model is the model is on my side of the it is going to be razor thin. And uh, I I think that's the way all of us see it. But you know, Cece and I are just on slightly opposite sides here. The model Very. is with you. So millimeters, metric system. Millimeters. <laughs> all right. Now I can say that series of the North Division second round behind us. We have another series starting on this Friday, this Friday evening, and that is number two Manitoba versus number three Milwaukee in the Central Division. Let's run down that schedule real quick. Game one, like I said, Friday, May 6th at Milwaukee, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. All of these are going to be Central Standard Time, by the way. Game two, Saturday, May 7th at Milwaukee at 6 p.m. Game three, Wednesday, May, uh, May 11th, rather, at Manitoba at 7 p.m. And if necessary, game four will be Friday, May 13th. Nice little Friday the 13th game there at Manitoba, 7 p.m. And the other, if necessary, game, game five, Sunday, May 15th, once again, at Manitoba. So those first two games at Milwaukee, potentially the last three games at Manitoba, of course, nothing is uniform in the AHL playoff scheduling when it comes to home games. So... Let's start with the moose. Every night is meese night up there in Manitoba, Canada. So, Sean, how did we get here? Season record for the Manitoba moose, uh, 41 and 31, good for a 618 points percentage. Uh, the last 10 games kind of limped into the season or limped into the, the playoffs a little bit there. Five and five net power play, 16.8%, good for 12th in the league. Net penalty kill, 85% even, good for 12th in the league. If Manitoba wins, it'll be another team effort. Uh, all season, Manitoba has thrived being able to roll four lines that don't feature any game breakers per se, but are full of guys you just can't sleep on. Um, and yet, outside of Manitoba, I feel like everyone's sleeping on Manitoba because they lack that star power. And that's a mistake. You don't win 41 games in this league without top scores by puck luck, which is also something the Moose haven't been overly blessed by this year. They've had very average puck luck going into the season. They've had peaks and valleys as usual, but this isn't a team that's been carried by PDO benders. If the Moose win this series, it'll also be because they win the physical battle without the parade to the penalty box. I think it's pretty clear this is going to be a physical series. Both teams are loaded with big, strong physical players. Evan Poli and Joseph Labate, just to name two. However, Manitoba cannot afford to take regular trips to the penalty box. It's been... 
an up and down season for Milwaukee in just about every aspect of hockey there is. They've looked great at times. They've looked terrible at times. But one thing that has worked pretty consistently is their power play. It wasn't white hot to finish the season, but I think testing it for the Moose here is playing with fire. I cannot imagine the Moose winning a series where they're giving up five plus power plays a night to Milwaukee. So they'll need to find a balance between physicality and penalty very quickly if they want to win. That's the, the Canadian side. Give me the, uh, the American side here, CC. All right. We're talking Milwaukee Admirals now. How they got here, season record 39 and 37. Last 10 games, 6 and 4. Net power play and rank 19.4%. Top three. Good for third in the AHL. Net penalty kill, 81.7%. Not good for 23rd in the AHL. So let's talk about how what it's going to take for them to get be victorious if they win. It's because, one, the penalty kill actually stepped up. And we've covered it all season long. Milwaukee has been notorious for its passive penalty kill. And being in the bottom third of the PK ranking shows that there are numbers. There's data to back that up. The last five games of the regular season, though, the ads went 16 for 19 on the PK at a kill rate of 84.2%. Sorry, it's not a net ranking. That would rank tied fourth in with Central Division rival Iowa, but fourth league-wide for the regular season rankings. So not a bad rate those last five games. They also blanked Chicago on the power play, 0 for 4. Texas on the power play 0 for 5 and Iowa went 0 for 3 because of Milwaukee's PK in those three, three of those last five games. The ads seem to have figured out a solid PK method. If they stick to it and win the special teams battle with that uh, third ranked power play as well from the regular season, uh, they'll win the series. Secondly, if they will win if they don't chase the game. In the regular season, when winning after one period, the ads won 86.4% of their games. Third in the AHL. Tied after one period, the ads won 46.2% of their games. 18th in the AHL. Losing after one period, the ads won 28.6% of the time, and that was 17th in the AHL. And if you saw them play regularly, those numbers probably don't surprise you as when the ads started cold, they stayed cold. But if the Admirals win this series, it is because they started hot and didn't chase the game. They have to come out of the gate swinging. That'll be a key to success. For our X factor for the series here, uh, I think it's pretty obvious who it is. It's Yaroslav Askar Askarov, uh, without a question here. I can't think of the last time a goalie came to North America with this much hype behind him already. 13th overall pick, which is insanely high for a goalie these days. And a lot of respectable drafts, uh, act, draft analysts and scouts were okay with it. Like they thought it was still a little high, but it wasn't outside what they thought was reasonable. He only got 18 games uh, this season in Russia. And while he was fine in them and still is getting, despite rave reviews from scouts everywhere, how he adjusts to the North American game with a brand new team in front of him in a best of five series is a big question. He is not guaranteed to ball out here right away. We've seen a lot of very talented goaltenders uh, come over to the AHL from Europe and, you know, not knock it out of the park right away. And I don't think it's unreasonable even for the pedigree and the, uh, the hype that Ask uh, Askarov has to, you know, see him struggle a little bit in the early going. But the problem is this is the best of five. There aren't throwaway games that you can have here. And he might not even be the game one starter. Devin Cooley, at least in hearing him answer questions for the media, certainly seems like he thinks he's going to be the game one starter. That's yet to be seen. But at the same point, I, you know, you have to imagine you don't bring Askarov over to North America and then have him ride the pine this entire series. But if he comes in and the hype and lives up to the hype, the fact that Connor Ingram isn't in town isn't the death blow that it felt like it was for this series. But he is very much, you know, how he plays in this series is going to put its thumb on the scale one way or the other because Milwaukee has needed Connor Ingram to steal them many a game this, this year when they've played poorly in front of him. I don't know if Devin Cooley is up to that task. Askarov very much might be. And if he is, that's going to change the outcome of this series. And if he's not... That will also be an outcome changer. So that's why he is our X factor. All right. Time for the picks. 
And with that very X factor in mind, that's a concern for me, not having Connor Ingram in that still. I mean, d- who's it going to be? Is it going to be Devin Cooley? Is it going to be Askarov? You know, it, I mean, even if Askarov comes in that and, you know, again, it, it takes adjustment for the North American game. It's, you know, obviously smaller rank and, and to have the speed, it's just there's going to be an adjustment regardless. So I'm going to have to go with Manitoba. And I'm I'm in the same boat here. Like mm-hmm. I, if you told me this was Connor Ingram and not Askarov, I think I might take Milwaukee here. Maybe like it would be mm-hmm. close. I'd have to look at it a little bit more. But like when you have that big a question mark in Nets, even one that has you know uh, been had his praises sang by many a you know uh, a keen scout in the public and private sphere, I, I still I, I would take that. I'm going to take the devil. I. I know here and take Manitoba and the moose. Um, I, I just can't in good faith put it that blindly in Milwaukee, especially with how badly they've played in front of Ingram and needed Ingram to bail them out. I, I got to take Manitoba here. I, I feel like I might regret this, but yeah, I'm, I'm going <laughs> Manitoba. The model um, for also for the record does not have Askarov programmed into it. Like when you bring in a skater from Europe, there are ways to translate their factors into AHL points and to generate a number for the model that way. It's not a perfect science, but it is at least something that you can, you know, try and estimate that does not exist for goaltenders. There is no translation for that, uh, that I've ever seen or am aware of. So the number for the model is with, is with Devin Cooley playing and, the model then has it, uh, Manitoba is a 60.9% favorite over Milwaukee. Yeah. Connor Ingram is a big part of that team's structure. And because I can't plug a number in for Askarov, I have only to go with Devin Cooley. And that's what we got. That's what we got. And Ingram, starting game two for the Nashville Predators in the Stanley Cup playoffs against the Colorado Avalanche. I mean... Godspeed to him because yeah, <laughs> that's a. I mean, he came in relief, only allowed two goals after Riddick, you know, let up five goals against the Abs in Game One. And I watched it. I'm like, I leaned over to my significant other and I said, Ingram's going to start Game Two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, lo and behold, yeah. I mean, something's wrong with Riddick. So, well, but anyway, uh, that's yeah, we... <laughs> another topic for another time. Yeah, that will do it. For episode number 99 of the Calder Farmstead, next episode's going to be the award show, and next episode's going to be the century mark, number 100. It's kind of a big deal for us. And uh, yeah, we're excited. We are totally excited. But hey, thank you for watching and or listening. The Calder Farmstead is part of the Full Press Radio Network. You can listen to this and several other great hockey, sports, and sports entertainment programs at www dot fullpresscoverage.com just click the podcast drop down menu in the top right portion of the website Brrr, that's the grand list populating if you're not familiar with that noise and enjoy and of course as always thank you with all the great programming out there for tuning in to the calder farmstead and if you guys are enjoying the calder farmstead please make sure you subscribe so you get episodes in a timely fashion also if you're listening on apple Podcasts, spotify or amazon please rate and review the podcast or if you're watching on youtube please like the video and comment what you thought of the episode Doing so helps others find the show and your reviews help us improve the show. You can also follow the show on social media at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at The Calder Farmstead on Facebook and Instagram. Links to all of that and more can be found on our Linktree page, which is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash The Calder Farmstead. Big thanks to Adrian Drake who made our theme music. You can find uh, you can find him on social media at AD underscore dysfunction. That's AD underscore D-Y-S-F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N so we can make music for you too. CC, where can people find you? Well, my name is CC Hockley. You can find me representing Full Press Hockey on Twitter at FPC underscore AHL. I do my best to keep up on all the AHL news, it's award season, and of course the playoff results and what those updated brackets are going to look like once uh, some series get decided here. You can find me at my personal Twitter account at CC Hawk, S-E-E-S-E-E-H-A-W-K. Mainly tweet about hockey. Big surprise there. But I'm a classic rock fan. I'm a pro wrestling fan. Love me a good movie every now and again. Hopefully, if it keeps me interested, it's not going to be bullshit for you. Check out my writing on the Full Press Coverage Network at fullpresshockey.com. Game one of Colorado and Henderson went to the Eagles. 
five to two victory after a couple of empty netters there in the third period game recap is up there at fullpresshockey.com. Sean, enough about me. Where can the people find you? I'm Sean O'Brien. You can find me on Twitter at Sean O'Brien 81. That's S E A N O B R I E N eight one. I'm also on Instagram at Sean O'Brien underscore 81. Uh, both are personal accounts. My Twitter is mostly hockey, but occasionally it's, you know, pop culture takes and stuff like that. My Instagram is not terribly active. It's mostly pictures of my dog, but I do do the jersey of the day every uh, day on there. I have a ridiculous number of them. If you've watched the show, you've probably seen that. And this felt like a fun way to kind of showcase them. You can find all of my stats work, including the model, all the graphs you see every Thursday, that kind of thing, on my Tableau page at bit.ly slash data dump and chase, all lowercase, all one word. Cece, take us home. That will do it for episode number 99, the last Calder Farmstead episode in double digits. We'll see you for the century mark for episode number 100, where we will dress to the nines. Not the 99s, but just the nines. So, yes, we're excited. Century mark, episode number 100, AHL Awards show. Doesn't get better than this, Sean, I tell you what. For Mr. O'Brien over there, I'm CeCe Hockley. Y'all keep your stick on the ice.